analyzing the effects of the regulation and deregulation agreements to the aviation industry by Renee Daniels. For almost 15 years, I worked at the Florida Department of Transportation. I managed the control room of operators who monitored highway traffic and dispatch road rangers. Our role was to assure drivers are safe and provide assistance to those who find themselves in not so favorable situations. So when I decided to move forward towards another one of my career goals, I made the decision to take the gr my ground transportation experience into the aviation industry. And what better way to gain the knowledge that I need to succeed than to go back to school? A year ago, I was fortunate to be honored the opportunity to join the Everglades University family in the Aviation Master's Program. Aviation has always been a fascination of mine. And over the last year, I learned about flight simulation, air transportation systems, part 139 certifications, logistics, safety programs, and the airport and field operations. And the information I acquired puts me at a better advantage for furthering my career. But out of all the topics I learned, the one concept that caught my interest is the deregulation of the aviation industry. And it made me think. Can an agreement signed in 1978 achieve the same objective to an industry and to a community that has evolved over 40 year span. In this presentation, we will look at key points of the regulation and deregulation era, comparing the pros and cons and determining if deregulation is still a right fit for today's industry. I will highlight a few of the regulation era and discuss why the government relinquished its power. Next, you will hear about some of the technology that changed the look of aviation, how it promotes better business operations for the airlines and the passengers over the years. And finally, I will talk on the progression since the Deregulation Act was first signed, then give my recommendations on the future of deregulation in aviation. So imagine what a viable re regulated aviation industry could look like today. It's not impossible. I mean, regulatory policies only change the way airlines charge fees, schedule flights, employ staff, render customer service, practice safe airline operations, and compete with one another. Basically, the policy controls the way the aviation industry operates as a business. Now let's examine some of the positive highlights between regulation and deregulation. Under regulation, we have government control and subsidies. We have the birth of the new airport tra air transportation system, the first air mail delivery service, rapid aviation growth, and the initiation of the Civil Aeronautics Act of 1938. Under deregulation, we have the elimination of economic regulations. The program also protects employees from bankrupt airlines. It provided a few amendments for some of the previous agreements under the Civil Aeronautics Act. It allowed more service to smaller communities. And with the elimination of the Civil Aeronautics Board, the program was more focused on protecting customers' interests. Now, here is some of the reasoning behind the Regulation Act. In 1938, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed the Civil Aeronautics Act of. At the time, Postmaster General held the responsibility to oversee all domestic air mail contracts between the airlines and the Postal Service. 
He created the air transportation system in hopes of faster mail delivery. But the president began to see collusion and monopolization in the industry and found that the airlines were bidding for contracts to deliver the mail. To the airlines, these contracts meant stable business and revenue. But unfortunately, the Postmaster General Brown would only allow airlines with an agreement with the Postal Service the opportunity to commercially transport passengers. Now let's look at some of the negative aspects of the two agreements. Under regulation, there is collusion and monopolization, higher airfares, a decline in service demand due to airline high ticket prices. It was found that the CAB failed to exercise power that they held to regulate the airline industry for lower prices. And it was also found that the CAB irresponsibly used resources to limit competition. On the deregulation side, we have congestion, congested airspace and airports now that the popularity of traveling is growing, travelers held concern with safety since the government still hold that portion of the agreement, especially after 9-11. The limitations of airport expansion, seeing less construction, renovation, and expansions to airport facilities. The deterioration of service due to low ticket pricing. And finally, more complaints about mega carriers still dominating the industry. As the years progress, President Eisenhower took office. He believed in the air travel system. Once he took office, the government began to interact more with the aviation industry. Eisenhower brought his knowledge of flying and made sure to cultivate the industry. His fascination with aircrafts helped change the world of aviation. In 1936, the Douglas DC-3 was designed with 14 sleeping berths, but later they were replaced with 28 seats to hold passengers, more passengers. With incorporation of new features and designs like lighter material, twin engines, and wider bodies, created aircrafts more fit to support the increase of travel demands. Eisenhower insisted on having vehicles at his disposal, so the birth of the first Marine One helicopter and the first Air Force One airplane took flight. He also spoke about some of the planes he flew in the Army, like the Aero Commander 680. the Lockheed C-121 Constellation, which also employed as an Air Force One vehicle, the Boeing 707-150 that later Pan Am used for regular traveling services, and the Lockheed VC-121E, which was the final choice for Air Force One airplane. The reason we focus on the technology of deregulation is because of, in 1938, there was a boom in advancements. Everything was new and ideas created new products. Once the Civil Aeronautics Act was signed, these new ideas and inventions needed approval before they were seen by the public. Not to take anything away from the era, they did invent tools to track weather, communication devices to talk to pilots in flight, and the air traffic control center. Or we can look at today's technology like drones, space shuttles, 
and simulators. Now that we have established some of the aircrafts available, we should also recognize how airports adapt to more travelers and scheduled flights. It comes down to the airport structures and how they will accommodate the increased flow of traffic. Engineers changed the way planes approach the facilities. Airports went from dirt runways to concrete and planes began to park right at the terminals to let their passengers on and off. The model design of these airports were determined by the number of flights assigned and the destinations the airlines fly to. The hub and spoke and point to point models are used more frequently. The hub and spoke is found at hub airports. Not all airlines fly to these hubs so passengers are forced to choose flights and stop at one of the facilities, like the Hartfield Jackson Atlantic International Airport. The point to point model are found at smaller airports, like the San Francisco International Airport. They are usually limited to the number of scheduled flights and the routes are direct to one location. These flights are usually lower in cost and have shorter travel times. In conclusion, under the regulation era or the Civil Aeronautics Act, it was signed to stop the collusion within the industry. There was a massive growth in technology and innovation because it, is, it was a new industry. The tight reins of the government had over the industry limited what was pr being produced. Too expensive. Travel by air was not as popular and the average family could not afford to fly. The Aeronautics Board, an agency assigned to regulate and monitor the industry were found inconsistent with protocol and show favoritism to legacy airlines. Under deregulation, it abolished the Civil Aeronautics Board. Companies were granted freedom to run their companies as they see fit allowing the customer's interest to be the primary focus. Lower fares, with more companies entering the market, it was a, ra a race to appeal to the consumer. More competition, the government is no longer regulating who can be in business. Increased routes, companies began choosing to expand service geographically technology and innovation, they were no longer constrained, given opportunity to explore other avenues in aviation. My recommendation, now that we've seen how far aviation has come over the last century, we can confirm that the progression of the industry continues to move in the right direction. Private companies are taking part with expanding the market and moving aviation into space. I can say the industry has evolved and is better under the de deregulation laws. I believe it provides better opportunities for all airlines, no matter the size of the company. The freedom to customize service to meet the needs of the customer and the company is always at an advantage. The company is only as successful as the work they put in, and companies that work for their customers are working towards sustainability. Thank you for watching.